Good morning. I'm Anna Marie, and it's time again for Focus. Today, we're going to take a look at the state of music and the state of musicians in this time of quarantine and see what has changed, what might need to change in future. And we're talking with Dave Pomeroy. He's the president of the National Musicians Association. Dave, thank you for joining us today. My pleasure. So let's start with what is the Nashville Musicians Association? What is this? Um, Well, we are the Nashville branch of the American Federation of Musicians, which was founded in 1896. The Nashville chapter was founded in 1902. uh, And we are the third largest chapter of the AFM uh, in in the U.S. after New York and Los Angeles. And Nashville has always been noted as a place where musicians are respected and they are paid Uh, fairly in a way that is not always happening in other places, including New York and L.A. And it started um, back quite a long time ago. Nashville was an education center. The Fist Jubilee Singers were the first musical ambassadors for Nashville in the 1800s. Oh, Late 1800s, they went overseas touring to raise money for Fisk University and singing their incredible gospel uh, choir music. And so they were the first ones to really make an impact uh, outside of, of the U.S. And then, you know, with the development of the Grand Old Opry, and then eventually in the 50s when the record labels came to Nashville and set up offices because they saw there was money to be made in hillbilly music, uh, when Elvis's contract was sold from Sun Records in Memphis to, Nash- to, to RCA, they immediately came to Nashville and started recording instead of in Memphis and uh, everything from Heartbreak Hotel onwards. So there's always been this tradition of respect for musicians, and and Chet Atkins and Owen Bradley, who were the two people that were picked to run RCA and Decca Records, they said to these labels, okay, we'll take this job, we'll, we'll give you some great music, but these musicians are our colleagues, our friends, our peers, and we're going to pay them correctly under a union contract. And that's the reason that when the 1962 Patsy Cline record, Back in Baby's Arms, gets used by Mazda, we were able to pay the musicians who worked on that record and their beneficiaries today's rates for a two-year two, two ad campaign. So a 90-year-old violin player, a wonderful guy named Soli Fott, came in and picked up a check for $2,000 a couple of years ago for something he got paid $58 for in 1962. Whoa. And so we protect intellectual property. We create standards for musicians. There is no other organization looking out for musicians. And you said it's not just musicians who are members of the union. Well, Tennessee being a right to work state, or as we call it, right to work for less, <laughs> because you can negotiate down all you want. Um, you know, we cannot force people to join the union, nor can we restrict their ability to work under our contracts on the surface seems like it would be a deal breaker and we wouldn't even exist. But because people do understand the power of putting something on a union contract and eventually the power of being a union member, our goal is to make it a no-brainer. It's like, why wouldn't I want to be part of this organization that's already looking out for me even though I'm not a member yet? Mm -hmm. So the, the other musicians in Nashville who are not members have no advocate. So by default, I am their advocate. And so when I work with the mayor's office, about things like home studios. This is not limited to union members. If I'm working with the uh, police and the taxi commissioner about solving some of the downtown problems, uh, I'm doing it for everyone, not just for our members. Speaking of home studios, uh, maybe we should kind of dive into that. People have been at home so much. uh, Gigs have been canceled. Tours have been canceled. Shows have been canceled. And now people have been trying to work at home. And so what is the home studio situation? And and what just happened? Yeah, what just happened was after more than eight years of trying, uh, we finally got Metro Council to add home studios to the list of legal home businesses. The, the issue was having customers on site. Under the previous metro regulations, you can have a studio in your house, but you can only work alone. Mm. And, and in many cases, musicians do work alone in a home studio. But, but nowadays, people make records there with a whole group. And, and, and understanding the concerns of those opponents of, well, we don't want to mess up our neighborhoods. We don't want to have big equipment trucks parked in the driveway of a residential house. But the people who have home studios, the vast majority of them, have no desire to ruin their neighborhood. In fact, they're looking out for their neighborhood, and they're at home during the day when other people are at work. And if something as weird is happening, they might have a better chance of stopping it. Mm-hmm. So it's just one of those things was kind of a quirk of Metro Nashville rules because it's a relatively 
young city. You know, we were only incorporated in like 1955. So there was it was an exception in the list of legal businesses to have home recording. And so we tried and could not get it passed uh, about five years ago. And then there was another effort this year. And I think the main reason it passed was because the demographic of the council is very different than it was five years ago. It's a much younger, much more aware council of and and the members in terms of like how people work and how people do business. It has a sunset clause, as they call it, where two and a half years from when it was passed a few months ago, they will, it will come up again to see how the impact was. And I'm pretty confident that the fears of those who thought this was going to create uh, some home studio version of Airbnb party houses is not going to happen yeah. because the musicians, as we've said to the mayor and the council and anyone else who will listen, musicians are already here in neighborhoods and they know how to be good neighbors. And that's why you don't know they're there in your neighborhood. Uh-huh. And it's just to get that across to Metro Council took about eight years, but we finally did it. So my home studio is now legal. Well, so in- <laughs> Ooh, now you can say you have one. It's interesting that you say that that was kind of a holdover from what, 1955 when Nashville was incorporated, yeah. because technology has changed a thousand percent since Absolutely. then. It's changed so much. It could not have crossed their minds no. back and, then. And there was no, you know, the idea of making a record in your house no. was, was just unthinkable. But the technology has evolved and we need to acknowledge it because we don't need to convince people of the value of music and what br- music brings to Nashville. And, you know, when you've got Grammy-winning records being made and mixed in, in illegal home studios, it just doesn't make sense. So yeah. we're very uh, glad to, to help get that done. A fellow named Lidge Shaw, a studio owner who got shut down by somebody who was jealous uh, because he couldn't get his home business going, so he had Lidge shut down. And Lidge kind of led the charge, but we jumped right in because we had a lot of institutional knowledge of the problem. And so we were able to work together and get it done. What has changed during the quarantine in the music world? Well, a lot. You know, touring musicians who primarily have their income touring with one particular artist are among the hardest hit because they go from one good job to nothing. Whereas freelance musicians uh, who are in town, maybe doing some recording, some live stuff have a little better chance of of surviving that also the club musicians especially those on lower broadway obviously there's huge problems there with crowds with enforcement um Mm -hmm. i think studio musicians have not been hit as hard but they have as well because there's just more hurdles to getting a group of people in the studio but again because of technology we've seen a lot of collaborative sessions where people are essentially passing the mm-hmm. files around amongst themselves, which has been happening more and more. And, and over the last decade, we've created various uh, contracts and scales that reflect that new reality and that things are not always in sessions are not always in three hour chunks with with a seven piece band and the leader making double scale and all that. So we developed something called the single song overdub scale where a musician can be paid by the song which is really the unit of commerce in the real world nowadays yeah. where they send you a song and they don't want to know how much it is for a two hour limited pressing session with H and W and cartage and pension, which is gobbledygook to most people. We understand what that means. But what we did was we developed a scale to where it's a hundred dollar a song minimum, no maximum, but all of those other factors of our contract are built into the round number, which is the only scale that does that. So out of a hundred dollars, $11 is going to pension. Uh, you know, a certain percentage is going to health and welfare, and then a certain percentage of scale. I think the scale is about $83. So we were able to build that in because people that don't understand the way union contracts work, they don't understand all that other stuff. And this is a way to simplify it and capture work that was getting away because we didn't have a simple way to capture it. Because mm-hmm. when you pay on something for somebody, it can go anywhere in this day and age. It might be in the next Steven Spielberg movie. And if it's not on a contract, you're going to get left behind of a revenue stream. Essentially, you're being denied something that you deserve that a third party would be paying Mm -hmm. if you don't file it under a contract. Because when it's on a union contract, we can go to the film company and say, excuse me, Paramount, uh, you know, this song that you're using in this movie that has an AFM soundtrack, uh, we need to file this with you and pay a new use to the players for the use of their of their music but also tie them to the residual stream. Um, 1% of that of any movie's gross, once it leaves the theaters, 
goes to the musicians who played on the soundtrack. Wow. It's one of it's it's kind of the golden goose of our various residual contracts. The Film Secondary Markets Fund distributed eighty million dollars to musicians. Like, wow, uh, who had worked on films that were covered. And another one of our uh, things is the AFM SAG AFTRA Intellectual Property Fund pays based on satellite radio play, primarily Sirius XM, but also Stage One Pandora. I'm a trustee of that fund. We distributed $62 million last year, a lot of which went to Nashville musicians who play on songs that are getting airplay. And we had musicians getting some very large, nice checks as a residual. And if you don't protect your work by putting it on a contract, you're putting all of that at risk. A lot of times musicians had been, it it, it was basically, uh, Joe asked me to play something on this and then I pop in and play it. But if you don't have it, like you said, on a contract, it's just, it's off into the atmosphere and it's just, it's just gone. Well, what we say is when you work without a contract, what you get paid that day is all you're ever going to make. Right. And you're, you're leaving lots of money on the table that you have no, you have no way of knowing what the future can hold. And it just involves having that conversation. Hey, you know, could you think we could put this on a contract in that way? And, and as I tell musicians all the time, it protects the employer mm-hmm. as well as the musician. Because if something good happens, we, the AFM, has the right to go to Paramount or go to Clorox and say, excuse me, you know the rules. you got to pay these folks. Yeah. And it's not coming out of the artist or the songwriter's pocket. And it's not just some voice in the wilderness. I mean, they're not out there by themselves anymore. Exactly. And that's the whole idea. You know, one of our slogans is if we don't if if we don't have your back, who does? (laughs) Because there isn't anybody else looking out for for the little folks. And and, you know, and what's unique about Nashville is, is that we have a really positive, friendly relationship with the vast majority of our employers which is not necessarily true in some of the other music cities where sometimes it feels like these relationships between labels and publishers and movie companies and musicians are just born to be confrontational and, 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 you know, Mm -hmm. problematic. And we've been able to find ways around that by just being nice about it. Excuse me. I I, sure you didn't mean to throw these folks under the bus. So let me help you. And we clean up a lot of projects that start out because part of technology is people start out on something and they don't know if it's a work tape or if it's going to become a record Uh. or what it is. You don't know. So we do understand that, that there's not always, okay, we're going to make a record that's going to get in a film. So we better you know? do that contract now. Yeah, and that's why we have a variety of contracts. We have demo, which is the cheapest, uh, and then limited pressing where you're allowed to release it up to 10,000 copies sold or or downloaded, and then there's an upgrade involved. Then we have low budget master, uh, which is for you know projects that are kind of medium budget, and then we have master scale. So we have a lot of different scales to fit different situations, and Nashville – one thing I'm very proud of in the 12 years that I've been president here is that we have gone from kind of the hillbilly cousin to being on the cutting edge and proposing things like the single song overdub scale and and the payment for live tracks on stage. In our contract with the record labels, for years it has said, you cannot use these tracks on stage. The idea behind that was to not put musicians out of work. You don't want somebody carrying tapes of a steel guitar player and then not hiring a steel guitar player. But like it or not, technology has evolved to where those tracks are available and people can use them. And so it started with a couple of artists that we have good relationships with. I don't mind naming them, Jason Aldean and and Dolly Parton. Mm -hmm. And we said, look, we understand you're using tracks on stage and we, we have, we'd like to come up with a compensation formula for this and we did oh we based, you didn't we didn't have it at no, all it yet. was all it said was it was prohibited it didn't say what happened if you did it uh-huh. there was no penalty there was no payment structure it was just you can't do that and so in our attempt to get with the real world we said hey i got an idea so we we so we worked at it here for a couple of years and got quite a bit of money and then when next time we went to the record labels we were able to say to them hey look we've developed a system that works we know because essentially what people don't realize is the, the tracks that are on the record, the individual tracks are the property of the record label. They don't belong to the artist unless it's the artist's own record label. Our enforcement mechanism involves saying to the label, excuse me, uh, artist A is using these tracks from the record. We're sure of it. We've spoken with the drummer and he's pressing a button and you've got loops and different things coming up. So uh, we're going to send you a bill. And, and, and if the artist doesn't pay it, we're going to send it to the label. Mm-hmm. And, and so it's taken a little adjustment on the part of some of the artist managers to understand that that stuff isn't for free. And that if they're going to use 
Ilya Tashinsky's banjo every night, they've got to pay him. Yeah. And and we and we worked out a, rel- a a very reasonable deal where if you're on one song or 20 songs, it's the same amount of money. It's about as much money as a hotel room would cost. Yeah. So it's it's fair, it's fair for the musicians. It, it's it's fairly reasonable for the artists. Right. We still don't want them to replace a musician with tracks. Mm-hmm. But the way records are being made these days, most of these tracks are a little incidental ear candy kind of things that aren't necessarily. I mean, now there are some some artists that will hire someone to sit there and run all those things in real time. But in most worlds, the drummer's got a drum machine and one, two, three, four, and he hits the downbeat and all these things come out of the speakers that aren't on stage. Yeah. Yeah. So that was something we were really proud of. And it's it feels good to feel like we're on the cutting edge of it. And the reason for that is because of the sense of community that we have in in our, you know, New York and L.A. are great places with wonderful creative communities. But by very by the very nature of the size of the city and the type of work, they're really fragmented. Mm -hmm. The jazz players in New York don't have a whole lot to do with the people who play in the Broadway clubs. And in New York, the the folks who play on records don't necessarily have a lot to do with the folks that play on film soundtracks. And it's just here we seem to have a little more of an ability to have a consensus Mm -hmm. and go, hey, everybody, here's something we're thinking about. And, uh, you know, we'd, we'd like you to consider it. And like. We've now collected over a half million dollars in tracks being used on stage. Whoa. So I, I love getting musicians paid. That's that's really why I got into this whole thing, because when I moved to Nashville 42 years ago, all I wanted was to be a bass player in a band that people liked. I didn't know there were any other jobs in the music business. Oh, my gosh. If you're just joining us, I'm Anna Marie, and this is Focus, and we're talking about musicians and uh, what's going on in their world. And we're talking with somebody who's been very active in changing their lives for the better, the president of the National Musicians Association, AFM 257. Oh, my significant other... We were talking about this, and I told him I was going to interview you, and he said it was. It, it's interesting that you've been able to make such changes in the time that you've been holding office, in the time that you've been involved, because it used to be like when I got here, like in 86 or something, I remember it was kind of like the Big Bad Union. And yeah. people were like, oh, they're just looking to slap our hands if we do this. or that's, Yeah, and then kind like of a was... good old boys club, too, where if you knew somebody who knew somebody, you could do stuff, but if... You weren't one of the in crowd. Yeah. You know, it, a lot of people ran into that. It had a wall. very negative connotation. Absolutely. At, at and that and that that has been honestly the most important thing to me is to try to change that perception mm-hmm. because the musicians union is different with all due respects to, uh, to other labor unions. We're different in that we represent creators and we represent the creators of intellectual property. So it's not just like, well, what's your hourly wage? There's so much more to it. And a lot of it has to do with just just creating a work environment where musicians are not taken advantage of Mm -hmm. because people just because you love what you do doesn't mean that you should allow yourself or 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 let someone knowingly or not steal what's rightfully yours. Yeah, it's your job. It's your yeah, work. And and I just, what I found, especially with the right to work thing, that way, wagging a finger or slapping a hand doesn't work. Do you find that dealing with creatives, that you have to do things differently uh, as far as contracts and paperwork, that right brain, left brain thing, a lot of times creative people, are they have a real hard time with documents. Do you find that you have to do things differently to deal with so many artists? Yes and and no. I, the stereotype of musicians not being good with paperwork definitely exists in some cases, uh, and and you know, and that's kind of why the union is there to make that stuff simpler, not to make it more complicated. And so I I, I can't completely buy into the stereotype, but I do understand that sometimes, especially the first few times that you've dealt True. with union contracts, once you've done it a few times, I think it's a little easier to deal with. Are there different needs for different genres of music? Uh, yeah, and I think, but maybe more so, maybe more so from um, the diff- not so much genres as the different types of musicians, whether you're a studio musician, oh. whether you're a Nashville Symphony member, whether you're a club. Uh, you know, studio musicians have had more ability to adapt in the current environment than most, and we've gotten a surprising amount of contracts. Wow. Uh, you know, because people can work at home, mm-hmm. and they can work in a studio, and some of the studios here have been really great in terms of creating a safe environment like yes. you all are doing here in the in the in the station um you know sound emporium on belmont you know they're you know making really sure that everybody who comes in there uh is protected and you know unfortunately 
in this day and age has become a political issue. And we've tried to diffuse that everywhere we can and, and just make it clear that, hey, you know, it's, uh, wearing a mask is a sign of respect yeah. for the other people around you. It's, 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 it's not a political move. It's an IQ test. You know? <laughs> <laughs> what do you see changing for musicians? Uh, more in-home studio work, more sending the files around, less concerts. Are, are concerts yeah. going to come back? I, I, I soon? hope so. I think it's going to be it's going to have to be by nature a very gradual thing. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think as we slowly and hopefully safely ramp things up, I think we'll continue to see more of the online broadcasts, um, you know, where, you know, people are getting more and more used to getting entertainment that way mm-hmm. rather than like, oh, well, I'm bored, so I'll go to YouTube and watch some stuff. Sure. Where it's actually like scheduling like, oh, it's 8 o'clock on the 27th. I want to tune into that one-time only stream. And one of the things that we've done with the union, we have a, a, one of our sub-organizations is called the Music Performance Trust Fund. And the trust fund is currently offering full payment for a one-time streaming event for any kind of a nonprofit um, organization that wants to do a streaming event. There's funding to pay the musicians for that for the gig and for a one-time stream. If the stream stays up, that enters into some other financial equations. But we've come up with something that allows people to do these kind of public one-time streams for Whoa. free. And have the musicians paid a hundred and it's usually about one hundred and ten bucks a player, and just any way that we can put money in players' pockets, we're trying to do. And yeah, um, you know, we've got several uh, litigation things going on right now that you know uh, we have reasonable confidence that we will win, mm-hmm. and that will help some of the folks. Uh, and there's a retirement. Yeah, we have a pension plan, pension plan. Um, w- that that comes uh, from any union contract that w- that you work on has a percentage over and above what you make. Some people try to portray it as being taken out of your paycheck, but it really is over and above negotiated, an amount that goes to our pension fund, which, like many multi-employer pension funds, has had its challenges over the last few years. They took a big hit in the stock market in '08 that they've yet to fully recover from. We are funded at a low enough percentage to where it's defined by the by the government as critical and declining, which means that it will run out of money in 20 years if nothing is done. Mm-hmm. Uh, we have tried several legislative uh, solutions. Unfortunately, they've all run aground and, and they're all inside Mitch McConnell's desk. Mm. Uh, and so until there is a change in Washington, the legislative uh, solution, which would take us out of that status, You know, we're hopeful if there is a change that there's going to be an awareness that not only us but many other unions need help and that the current system set up is not really ideal and we're going to need to do more. Okay. We we also have an emergency relief fund to where if a member has a medical issue, is unable to work, they can apply once a year for up to $2,500 in financial assistance. We've also reinvented the 501c3 which means that uh, that's tax deductible as a donation, but it also means that we have to give it to non-members as well as members. So we created one in, in the wake of the flood fund, of uh. the flood called the Flood Relief Fund, raised $130,000, got $50,000 worth of instruments that we all gave that away without taking anything for ourselves. So that fund has been sitting there dormant, but it still exists with the IRS. So we have reinvented it as the Nashville Musicians Association Crisis Assistance Fund. And so we're now soliciting donations for that. But in the meantime, just in the last couple of weeks, a, a, a coalition called Hope 20 has come to us with funding for musicians and specifically for the Nashville Symphony. Uh, they've, they've allotted $250,000 for our members, one hundred and twenty-five for the regular members, and or actually and anyone who applies who's not a member would also be considered um, because of the t- 501c3 thing. And then also a certain amount of money is set aside for members of the Nashville Symphony because they have been furloughed for 15 months, Mm -hmm. which has been horrific. Yeah. Uh, And we're in the process of – we're in the middle of emergency negotiations with Symphony, but right now they're not coming up with solutions to put money in the pocket of musicians. So the musicians are doing things on their own. They're doing once-a-month concerts at St. George's Episcopal Church on uh, West End. You know, uh, this this Hope 20 coalition uh, came to us through a union member who was involved, who's, who hooked them up. And so we're hoping to see significant, it'll be about $250,000 in assistance to those members that need it the most. I think I'm seeing a lot of smaller 
gigs where everybody's stretched out. Like you sit there and if you get up from that table, you must wear your mask and pass by someone and mm-hmm. keep going. And there are smaller venues that are managing to do this. You think the larger venues are going to be able to do that social distancing or is it even well, worth it? Well, I, I mean, I, I hopefully, um, but I think it's got to come in some sort of logical timeline where we've seen the numbers change significantly enough. Uh, the Jackson Symphony in Jackson, Tennessee, did a performance um, a couple weeks ago, and they had the horns up on either balcony of the stage, and then musicians one to a stand instead of two to a stand. And, you know, knock on wood, everything seemed to go fine. But it's going to be gradual. I see that Third and Lindsley, which is, you know, a 500-seat venue, is just starting to reopen with some stuff. Mm -hmm. They've tried a couple times already. I think the big fear is opening too fast and getting a spike. That's what we're all worried about. Well, plus, uh, I think if you make the effort to open and the expense to open and the expense to pay everybody and then people are afraid to go in, it's it's a waste as well. So yeah, I think and so the on yeah the online concerts, uh, you know the the online stuff. I think has it's filled some of that gap and the virtual tip jar, which is kind of something that we had been a fan of before the COVID hit, just because the club owner can't put their fingers in it. <laughs> for starters, and there was a couple of horror stories of of some of the clubs reopening and having musicians play. And running the virtual tip jar and then taking most of the money and giving the musicians just a little piece. Oh, no. Well, there's always going to be those who run yeah, it. Yeah, and the bad us. behaviors on Broadway, uh, are, uh, they're pretty well known who they are. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> so how's Broadway? How are we doing with, uh, I mean, because it, music is It's hard to say. It's, it's our... really, you know, I think now, I, and, you know, I was out of town for a few weeks dealing with some family stuff. So, but my understanding is, is that, you know, we're now up to, I guess, uh, 50% capacity, I, so. I believe. And so, you know, honestly, I, I've, I've only been back a couple of days, so I haven't been down there in a bit. It's just slow. I think, I think everything really comes down from the lack of tourists, mm-hmm. you know, to where the clubs can open, but there's nowhere near the demand that there was. So I think just in terms of the economics, uh, it's, it's, it's a restart, not in a good way, mm-hmm. in that, you know, we were right on the border. We've been organizing the Broadway musicians, and we were right at the point where we were going to say— Okay, we're going to find a couple of club owners that would be willing to pay what we consider to be the appropriate scale, and then we're going to try to shame the other ones into bringing up their standards. And we were just getting ready. We've been working on this for a few years, and we were just getting ready to launch all that when it happened. And then mm. we're like, oh, okay, now we're into safety and health regulations. And we did create a bunch of those. The other thing that we've had to do that's never been on our radar before is unemployment. Uh, helping musicians and freelance people understand the unemployment system, which has never been set up for freelancers. Uh -uh. And in fact, just recently, while I was gone, the Tennessee Department of Labor made a unilateral change to where they're now requiring musicians to go to employers and and ask if there's any work three times a week, just like you would normally do in a normal employment environment. Uh. But there is no work. So there's really no one for them. I mean, I've been – people write me and say, is there any work available? I'm like, no, sorry. But now we've got apparently hundreds of people who are being asked this question that we were originally told musicians and freelancers did not have to answer that question because they understood that it was a unique situation. And how can you apply for a job that isn't there? Oh, my God. So we're that's going to be one of my jobs for the rest of the day and for tomorrow is mm-hmm. to try to get – some answers and or a modification of the policy from the Tennessee Department of Labor. Mm -hmm. But their communication system is really, really horrific. Mm -hmm. It's really, really hard to get anybody. Is there anything else you'd like to leave us with? We're talking with Dave Pomeroy, the president of the Nashville Musicians Association, AFM 257. Well, I would just say that, you know, Nashville is a very unique place. Mm -hmm. And I think that we are in a position, as we've been doing for some time, to show the world that there's more than one way to do things that you can be friendly and get work done. You can be friendly and have a negotiation and get what you need. And this system developed very organically. Uh, There's no other place where songwriters can come and have a chance at making a living. It's one of the last places on earth where your dreams might still come true. If you come at the, you meet the right person at the right time, you know, those success stories are still happening. 
that's very rare in other places. So I think we have the opportunity to show the world how it's done as we do go back to work safely and with respect for one another and understand that we don't want the club owners to go out of business, uh-uh. but we do want them to treat the musicians better than they did before. Yeah. And, and you know, you get what you pay for. And, and it's like we tell people who are on the fence about whether or not to do something under a union contract. And all I can tell you is, and I speak from my own experience as well as other people, when you're doing something on a contract, the musicians have a confidence that they're being taken care of. They're being respected. And if you need that extra 10%, you need 110% because 100 ain't enough, you're going to get it. Because you're you're demonstrating to them good faith, so we're you know we're looking out for people in as many ways as we possibly can. Nashville's been great to me. I moved around a lot as a kid. I never really felt like I had a home. This is my home. I've yeah. been here 42 years, and and I love it here. And I would encourage anybody that's interested or curious about what we do to get in touch. Our website is NashvilleMusicians.org. Uh, if you're interested in my music stuff, uh, a lot of crazy bass stuff uh, on DavePomeroy.com and the various streaming services as well as physical product. But thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. Thank you for coming in. Dave Pomeroy. We're going to put all those links on our Focus Facebook page so you can get more information. Make sure you join us again next week. I'm Anna Marie, and that's Focus.